Perhaps. Um, a couple people that left I had a conversation with in between, and even though the conversation stimulated thoughts that I'm going to respond to before we get started and they're gone, they're not going to hear the thoughts, I'm going to put them in the record in case some of you are being tempted the same way that they were tempted. <clears throat> Although you haven't seen all the lines yet, when the lines of prophecy, these reformatory movements are brought together, you begin to be able to draw certain conclusions from these lines. And one of them is, is that in every reformatory movement, in the development of the 144,000 is a reformatory movement, there is a message that is formalized. Miller formalized the message. Cyrus formalized the message. Uh, John the Baptist formalized the message. And when the message is in power, that particular message tests that, tests that generation during that time period. Okay? So, and I get a lot of criticisms for this. First off, I'm not the only one on planet Earth that is sharing this message. Okay? This message is being shared, shared by other people. But what I am saying is, if our understanding of these things is correct, then without a doubt, what you're hearing here is part of the testing message for the 144,000. And those of us that are tempted to come in and hear one or two presentations and then go home and think, ah, oh, yeah, that was interesting, but I have other things to do on Sabbath, I would submit to you that it could be, if we're correct, that this message is of such importance that it's absolutely dangerous to approach this message with that attitude. Now, I know also that the way that I do things, probably a little bit out of order, I, I do put stumbling blocks in front of people sometimes. In the conversation I was referring to, the brother already had formed some ideas about Islam, and here I am, what I'm saying is Islam is the third woe, and that Islam is the issue that brings about the Sunday law in the United States, and that it is the issue that empowers the third angel's message. And I'm saying that because the, the message that empowered the Millerite message was a message from the sixth trumpet, and the sixth trumpet is representing Islam, and therefore when the Millerite history is going to be repeated, for me to say the seventh trumpet is Islam and it empowers the, the message at the end is in agreement with the fact that Millerite history is repeated at the end, and there are several arguments to demonstrate that Islam is a subject of Bible prophecy, but you can't make those arguments, to, I don't think, until you put these things in place, and here we're putting them to place, in place on Friday and Sabbath, and then the meetings start in the evenings over this coming week, and some of you live, a, live far away, and some of you work in the evening, and, and other things. But if what we're saying is true, we need to understand this information. There are several arguments about Islam, and there's more to say than simply Islam. Let me give you one argument about Islam. The father of Islam, first let's go to Isaiah 44. The one characteristic of Christ that is most dwelt upon in Revelation chapter 1 is that he is the first and the last. And if you read Isaiah 40, Onward, you will see what it means, according to Isaiah, that Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. In Isaiah 44, verse 6, it says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God, and who, as I, shall call, and shall declare it, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people. Jesus illustrates the end of the world with the beginning of the world, and in order to illustrate the end of the world, he appointed the ancient people. And ancient Babylon is an illustration of modern Babylon in the book of Revelation. And ancient Egypt in the Old Testament is an illustration of Egypt in the book of Revelation. And ancient Israel is an illustration of modern Israel. The ancient people illustrate a modern people. Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. And if you go to Genesis, chapter 16, you'll find that one of the ancient people that was appointed was Ishmael. 
Now, brothers and sisters, you may think that I have the responsibility, if I'm going to say that Islam is the subject of Bible prophecy, you may think that I have the responsibility to prove to you why Islam is the subject of Bible prophecy. But what I say to you is I don't have to prove that. All I have to do is get you to agree that the foundations of Adventism are the truths that are represented on those two charts that Sister White says were directed by the hand of the Lord. Because on those two charts, and I'm going to walk over there for those of you that are um, running the cameras. On these two charts, the Islam of the fifth and sixth woe are illustrated. The fifth and, the fifth and sixth trumpet, which are the first and second woe. This is the first woe. This is the fifth trumpet. This is Islam. You see this horse here? And in Revelation 9, when Islam is identified, the symbol that's identifying Islam in Revelation 9 is a horse. And when they came to express Islam in these charts, symbolically, they looked to Revelation 9 and they used the horse. This horse is the Islam of the first woe, the fifth trumpet. This horse is the Islam of the sixth trumpet, the second woe. And when the Lord told James White to correct the errors on this chart, and they produce this chart. Here's Islam of the fifth trumpet, the first woe, and here's Islam of the sixth trumpet, the second woe. Islam is represented by a horse, but it's already established as a subject of Bible prophecy. It's already a subject, okay? How about Bush and Jesuits? <laughs> we'll deal with Bush and Jesuits later on in this week. Um, but this, like, we can't broaden it. That's the kind of argument I'm talking about. We can't broaden it too wide, but I want to, for those of you that are, are wondering about whether there are any valid reason to be mentioning Islam, in Genesis 16, 12, Christ appointed the ancient people to illustrate the end of the world. And you have the pronouncement of Ishmael in verse 12 of 16. And he says, and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And this is the father of Islam. And the role of Islam is that they're going to be a wild man, and their hands going to be against every man in the world. And they are the issue that brings the one world government together against them. They bring every hand together. This is the prophecy of Ishmael. And Ishmael's descendants, they will tell you, is Islam. And Islam has already been identified as a subject of Bible prophecy. But what I want you to see in verse 12 is when it says that the descendants of Ishmael will be a wild man. This word, wild, it's the wild Arabian donkey. It's the word that identifies the wild Arabian donkey. The donkey is in the family of horse. The horse is what symbolizes Islam in Bible prophecy. Okay? So... This word that's translated simply as wild has the connection to the horse. So if you go with me to Revelation chapter 7. This, I hope, is a familiar passage for Seventh-day Adventists. Verse 1 through 3 in Revelation 7. It says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the winds should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, though we sealed the servants of God in our foreheads, in their foreheads. Brothers and sisters, the Seventh-day Adventists, we understand that the angels hold the four winds back, when the 144,000 are sealed, correct? Okay, that's standard Adventist understanding. So in those three verses that we just read, where do we see the horse? Which verse is talking about the horse? Which Four verse? winds. <laughs> it's not in there, is it? Okay, Sister White says in Selected Messages, Book 3, page 409. Angels are holding the four winds represented as an angry horse seeking to break loose and rush over the face of the whole earth, bearing destruction and death in their path. When the angels are holding the four winds, they're identifying putting a restraint upon the angry horse that brings death and destruction. 
and according to the established understanding of the role of Islam in Bible prophecy, they're the angry war horse. And whether you realize it or not, on September 11, 2001, there was a restraint put on Islam. So brothers and sisters, this is just one of the arguments that we are going to suggest here as we approach the end. Islam is a subject of prophecy. And God's people need to come to grips with the prophetic message that's being unfolded by the line of the tribe of Judah at this time. Because we're the only one on planet Earth that can rightly identify who the false prophet, the beast, the dragon, and Islam is. And they are the subjects on the front pages of the newspapers every day to day. And God's people are sleeping on, and it's time that we woke up to our prophetic responsibility. Amen. Islam is a subject of Bible prophecy. This study here will nail that down airtight, but we're not going to finish this study until next Sabbath. And if you're not coming every evening, you're going to miss some of the biggest punchlines. And if what we're saying about this message is true, at minimum, you must commit to yourself to get the taste of doing here and the taste on the subject that we have recorded. In Matthew chapter 3, are we going back now to the subject of our uh, second? Yes, we're going back to our subject. I want to make at least the minor defense that Islam is something that we need to understand. No. But what's a line in Bible prophecy? What's a line in Bible prophecy? A line. Oh, I, I thought Satan was a line. Is it, oh, it's Babylon. I thought it was Judah. The, the symbols always have to be determined by context. Okay, so there are there are there are, there's horses in Zechariah. There's horses in in the seals. But the war horses of the trumpets that are represented on those charts are also the characteristics of, that, that they're bringing war, death and destruction in its path. Um, in Matthew chapter 3, going back to this, I got off track there. In verse 1, it says, not a problem, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And what we're saying, brothers and sisters, in, in in between, you were asking some questions, and I'm real, I was realizing that because I was going too fast, I'm taking all the blame, but maybe some of these waymarks are not being made too clear for you. But in these histories, there's always a time of the end, a prophecy that's fulfilled, and when it's fulfilled, it casts light upon the upcoming reformatory movement. When the prophecy is fulfilled, there's an increase of knowledge that begins to come about, about the upcoming reformatory movement. There are students of prophecy that begin to recognize this unfolding light, and as time progresses, the message of that history is formalized. It's put into a package. I don't know how to express it better than that. There may be a better way. In the Millerite history, it was William Miller that was used to formalize this message. There comes a point in time when the message, the message is empowered, and at that point in time, we will show you, Lord willing, that a testing process begins. So, in the, in the history of the first message, you see the foundations laid. William Miller is the man associated with laying the foundational truths that are represented on that chart. Um, this, being, this being the three decrees, the history of the three decrees, the foundation of the temple was laid in the first the history of the first decree. Um, so, in the history of Christ, the time of the end of the three decrees was the 70 year prophecy of Jeremiah 25 12, marking that it was time to come out and build Jerusalem. The, the prophecy that was fulfilled for the time of the end in the history of Christ was his birth, Isaiah 7. And when he was born, the time of the end was reached, and this shed light upon the upcoming history. He's going to confirm the covenant with many for one week. There's an increase of knowledge, and John the Baptist is used to formalize the message. And this is why Sister White often compares William Miller with John the Baptist. She also compares him with Elijah, and Elijah and John the Baptist are parallel. Um, Christ says, tells us that as well. 
there comes a time when John the Baptist's message is in power. And we've mentioned that. When the Pharisees tried to argue with Christ, he said, well, what's John the Baptist's John the Baptist, ministry of the Lord or not? And it was the fact that he had baptized Christ is what put the seal, the power, into his ministry where the Pharisees couldn't argue against it. But in Matthew chapter 3, speaking of John the Baptist, if you drop down to verse 5, it says, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about the Jordan. I want you to see that in the geographical setting of the history of Christ, John the Baptist's message, all the regions round about came out to hear John the Baptist. In the geographical setting of this history, his message was worldwide. Whereas the second message, which Sister White says the second angel's message was fulfilled in the USA, I have not read that to you, but it is valid. I'm going to at least mark it so we can have it as a point of reference. The second way mark in the history of Christ took place when the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem in a local area, made a choice that Christ should die. Worldwide, local. Uh, Cyrus's message, is, message was worldwide. And after verse 5, you will see John the Baptist identifying the, the foundational message of that hour. Notice verse 6 of Matthew 3. And were baptized of him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Baptism and confession was the foundational message of this time. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Part of the message of that time was the fulfillment of Daniel 9.26. The people of the prince shall come and shall destroy the sanctuary in the city. The destruction of Jerusalem was part of that message, and John the Baptist was identifying the foundational message of that history, the wrath to come. Verse 8, bring forth, bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. Repentance was part of that foundational message. And say not within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Part of the message of that time is that the Lord was about to set aside ancient Israel and raise up the Christian church. And that was identified by John the Baptist. The foundational message of that history was laid right here. With the work of John the Baptist, he goes on to, pro to identify the promise of the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist set forth the foundational message of his, of his history in the time period of the first way mark, just as the foundation of the temple was laid in the first decree, just as William Miller laid the foundation in the history of the first message. And Isaiah 58, 12 says, They that be of thee, of the 144,000, one of the works that they're going to do is raise up the foundations of many generations, and the reason for that is there's going to be an argument in Adventism about the, at the end of the world about whether we should stay on the platform and the foundation of Adventism or get off. And if you don't understand where the foundation was laid, if you don't have confidence that the message reflected on those charts that the Lord used William Miller to assemble, that if you don't understand that that is the foundation, and you don't understand it well from God's Word, then you're going to be tempted to, to listen to the modern theologians' arguments as they present to you the Protestant view of prophecy. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to be doing that. Mm -hmm. That's why 144,000 raise up the foundation of many generations. Another generation, and some of you were not here last night, I'm going to go very quickly on this one. But, if you turn to Revelation 10, verse 4, I've been going very quickly on all of it, so I don't know why I said that. Revelation 10, verse 4. When Christ comes down on August 11, 1840, with the little book of Daniel open in his hand, he puts one foot upon the sea and one foot upon the earth. He cries, as a lion roareth, and here, in verse 3, where Christ is identified as crying as a lion, there's only one other place in the book of Revelation where Christ is identified as a lion, and that's in chapter 5. He's identified as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And last night we went through and shared the quotes where the lion of the tribe of Judah, what he accomplishes is he unseals the Bible that's been sealed to seven seals. 
He unseals the Bible in Revelation chapter 5, right here at the time of the end in 1798, as he's unsealing those prophetic truths. Those are the prophetic truths that William Miller and the Millerites were coming to understand. The unsealing of that prophecy is what produces this experience. And the person that unseals this truth isn't William Miller. It is Christ. So when Christ is portrayed as the lion of the tribe of Judah, it is identifying his work in unsealing or sealing of prophecy. Because there's always a sealing of prophecies in all of these histories. And when it gets to verse 3 of Revelation 10, and he cries as a lion roareth, seven thunders utter their voices, and in verse 4, whatever the seven thunders are, they are told, John is told to seal them up. And we read last night that when Sister White comments on the sealing up of the seven thunders, she compares the sealing up of the seven thunders to the sealing up of the book of Daniel. She says this, after these seven thunders uttered their voices, the injunction comes to John as to Daniel in regard to the little book. Seal not those, seal up those things which the seven thunders utter. Sister White is comparing the sealing up of the seven thunders with the sealing up of the book of Daniel. But in this same passage, she tells us that the seven thunders represent two histories. The history of the first and second angel's message, which is the history of 1840. 1844, and she says that the seven thunders also represent future events that will be disclosed in their order. In other words, the seven thunders represent the reformatory movement of the Millerite time period, and the seven thunders represent the reformatory movement of the 144,000. This truth, this prophetic truth, is what opens up God's word to God's people at the end of the world. Brothers and sisters, it opens it up. I can show it to you, but perhaps if you if you'll cooperate. And those of you that know these test questions, silence is cold, all right? <laughs> verse 10 of Revelation 10 is a common verse, commonly understood in Adventism. It says, John, John the Revelator, and I took the little book out of the angel's hand. I took the little book of Daniel, according to Sister White, out of Christ's hand, and I ate it up. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was, and I ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Brothers and sisters, John is representing a people there. Who is he representing? Who do we know that he's representing there? Who was it that took the little book of Daniel in 1840? Why was the little book of Daniel in 1840 sweet to the Millerites? Why was it suddenly sweet? They've been preaching since 1833. They were ready to go. No, not because Christ was coming. When Christ was the preaching. Nope. There's a specific reason. Because on August 11th, 1840, the year day principle that they've been using to make the predictions about the end of the world was confirmed. And suddenly, what they've been preaching and nobody's been listening to, it was validated and their message became sweet in their mouth. They had an argument then that they had not had before August 11th. But by 1844, what happened? It was bitter in their stomach, right? So who is John symbolically representing here in verse 10? No. He's representing the 144,000. Go back to verse 8. It says, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Brothers and sisters, Sister White is clear that the Millerites did not understand the experience that they were going through in advance. And here John is told before he takes the little book and eats it that it will be sweet in his mouth and become bitter in his stomach. He represents a people that already know the Millerite history when they enter into the repetition of this history. He's representing the 144,000. But he's also representing the Millerites because that's the subject of Revelation chapter 10. The subject of Revelation chapter 10 is the seven thunders, and the seven thunders is the prophetic truth that the Millerite history is repeated at the end of the world in the history of the 144,000. Every reformatory movement is the same. 
and the reformatory of the Millerites is going to be repeated in the reformatory movement of the 144,000. And when you see that, suddenly there are passages of scripture that just open up to your understanding. Mm -hmm. Now, brothers and sisters, what this gets serious is in Revelation 22.11. Revelation 22.11, we all know what that is. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. What is that? Probation. That's when Michael stands up and human probation closes. That's verse 11. What happens just before the close of probation? Verse 10. Verse 10 says, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And brothers and sisters, there's only one prophecy in the book of Revelation that's been sealed up, and it's the seven thunders. And just before probation closes, there comes a pronouncement from the line of the tribe of Judah that the time is at hand to unseal the prophecy in the book of Revelation that's been sealed up. And that prophecy is the seven thunders, which teaches that the Millerite history is repeated in the reformatory movement in the 144,000. And the fact that we're discussing that here right now tells you that probation is about to close. Um, and Christ is unsealing his prophetic word before our very eyes in the history of the Millerites is being that's why we need to stick around and test this because if the claims we're making are true, we need to know they're not rejected. So, in connection with that, the history of Moses. Now, the history of Moses and the deliverance of Israel out of Egypt. I want you to think about something if you would. That's the beginning of ancient Israel. When they came out of Egypt and entered into a covenant relationship with the Lord at Mount Sinai, he married them, he gave them his law, gave them his name, he entered into covenant with them. And it wasn't until they were divorced at the stoning of Stephen that that relationship ended. And on October 22, 1844, for the second time in history, he entered, entered into covenant with a people, his modern Israel, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Entered into covenant with them because in Malachi chapter 3, the messenger of the covenant suddenly comes to his temple. He gave them his law, just as he gave to Israel. Um, he married them. That was the fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins. The marriage was all repeated again. But what I want you to see is that in the history of Moses, you have the beginning of ancient Israel. They come out of Egypt. That's the beginning. And the end of ancient Israel is the history of Christ. And why I, want you to, why I want you to see that, if you will, is what we're saying here is that the beginning of modern Israel, the Millerite movement, it's identical to the end of modern Israel with the 144,000. And the most significant symbol of modern Israel, the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the Scriptures, is ancient Israel. And I want you to see as we go through this, that the beginning of ancient Israel was identical to the end of ancient Israel. So for us to be saying that the seven thunders represents the truth, that the beginning of Adventism with the Millerites is identical to the end of Adventism with the 144,000, is a direct parallel <coughs> to ancient Israel. That there's always a time at the end in these histories but I don't know of a prophecy that was fulfilled in the story of Moses, but you don't need it. When you bring a line of prophecy, and brothers and sisters, whether you think about it or not, in Isaiah 28, when it says, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine, them that are weaned from the mouth? And then it says, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, that's what we're doing. We're taking prophetic line upon prophetic line from here and there, and we're bringing them together. And when you do that, you find, in agreement with the Bible, that when a prophetic characteristic is identified two or three times, it's established. It does not have to be in every line. So I don't know of a prophecy that marks the time of the end in the story of Moses, but I believe it's the birth of Moses. And the reason that I believe that is Moses is a type of Christ. And the time of the end in the history of Christ was the birth of Christ. And I, although I don't know of a prophecy that predicted the birth of Moses, I do know that in the story of Moses, when he was born, you can see prophetically illustrated an increase in knowledge. Because he's taken into the courts of Egypt, 
and his mother's brought along, and he, as he's getting educated in the schools of Egypt, he's simultaneously being educated in the school of God by his mother. And this increase of knowledge reaches the point that when he's a, a man, Israel already knows that he's supposed to be the deliverer of Israel from Egypt after he kills the Egyptian. That's what he's confronted with. So the increase of knowledge about the fact that this history here identifies the deliverance of Egypt is illustrated in that history. But as the increase of knowledge progresses, the message will have to be formalized. And who's the messenger in this history? It's Moses. And where is the message formalized? At the burning bush. Moses is given the message, go back to Egypt and take my people out of Egypt. But before, as we've already mentioned, before he makes it all the way back to Egypt, Christ comes down in Exodus chapter 5 and empowers his work. Let's get right to it. I'll read you something from the Spirit of Prophecy. I'm saying Exodus 5, it's Exodus 4, verse 24. And it came to pass by the way in the end that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Exodus 4, 24. And Sister White commenting on the circumcision test. It's a test of circumcision. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 255, says, On the way from Midian, Moses received a starting, startling and terrible warning for, of the Lord's displeasure. Dropping down, she says, he had failed to comply with the condition by which his child could be entitled to the blessings of God's covenant with Israel, and such a neglect on the part of their chosen leader would but lessen the force of the divine precepts upon the people. Zipporah, fearing that her husband would be slain, performed the rite herself. And the angel then permitted Moses to pursue his journey. In the mission to Pharaoh, Moses was placed in a position of great peril. His life could be preserved only through protection of holy angels, but while living in neglect of a known duty, he would not be secure, for he would not be shielded by the angels of God. It was at the circumcision that his message was empowered, that he was secured the right to the protection of the angels of God. And that took place when the Lord came down. Now, I haven't told you all the characteristics of these waymarks. I want to point out another one. They're easy to see at this point. Even to show these things typically. The first message is a message of reform. William Miller was a reformer. Sister Wright says that, that very plainly. The first message, the first angel's message, was a message of reform. Um, John the Baptist was a reformer. He brought a message of reform. And Moses, when he came to Egypt, brought a message of reform. What was the message of reform? The Sabbath. They had quit keeping the Sabbath while they were in Egypt. And he brought this message, by the way, to all of Egypt. And Egypt in the Bible is the symbol of the world. And the Jews began to keep Sabbath. And because of this, it enraged Pharaoh. So Pharaoh, I'm saying this because we all know this. I'm not going into the scriptures. I'm telling the story we all know because we don't have to go back and read every detail, because we're living in a time period when we're not supposed to be babes that are living on the milk of God's Word. We're supposed to already understand the milk of God's Word and be able to share truths at this level where we just refer to it. The Lord brought a message of reform, Sabbath reform, and when the Jews started keeping Sabbath, Pharaoh increased the amount of bricks they had to make, and he said, you have to go gather your own straw. That's the activities of the enemies. Right here. Part of the characteristics of the second message is a manifestation of the power of God. And the manifestation of the power of God that took place in the story of Moses it was the plagues that fell on Egypt. And what was the final plague on Egypt? Death on the first one, but how about judgment of the first one? Because judgment is illustrated here. Usually, 
usually in the writings of Ellen White. When Sister White's going to describe the disappointment of the Millerites on October 23, 1844, she goes to the disappointment of the disciples immediately after the cross. But there are places where she goes to the history of Moses, and she points out that immediately after the death of the first one, that the Jews found themselves with the Red Sea in front of them and Pharaoh's army behind them. And she says the Jews at that point were disappointed, and she compares their disappointment to the disappointment of the Millerites on October 23, 1844. And when they crossed the Red Sea, they were given a work to do. And their work was to sanctify themselves because Moses was going to go up on the mountain and receive the law. But what happened after they were given the work? They went into apostasy. Now there was a sister up here in between where she had understood me, and if there's any other of you that are understanding me this way, I want to clarify this for everyone. In these histories, God's people, after this third way mark, after the disappointment, are given a work to do. It's a sanctified work. Okay? But they always quit doing the work. So the apostasy is another way mark. She had understood me that I was saying a work of apostasy. These are two different things. They're given a work to do, and they go into a backslidden condition. The Jews were given the... Here, ancient Israel was given the work of sanctifying themselves on the morrow, for Moses was going to go receive the law, but they started dancing around the golden calf. But Moses did receive the law, and when Moses received the law, ancient Israel was to commemorate that event forever throughout all their generations. And what was that event? It was Pentecost. It lines up perfectly with Pentecost in the time of Christ. The Passover here when the angel of death passed over the firstborn of Israel, lines up with the cross. So what I want you to see is that John the Baptist parallels Moses, and the baptism of Christ where John the Baptist's message was empowered parallels the circumcision test in Moses' time, and circumcision and baptism are interchangeable terms, biblically. And then we have the activity of the enemies when the Sanhedrin chose that Christ should die rather than the whole nation perish. It's paralleling the activities of Pharaoh, increasing the bricks. Then the triumphal entry, where Christ said, if these children don't cry out, the very rocks will cry out. That manifestation of the Holy Spirit is paralleling the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the plagues, which concluded in the judgment of the firstborn, which is prefiguring the judgment of the cross which was followed by the disappointment of the disciples, which is paralleling the disappointment of the Hebrews by the Red Sea. And their work of sanctifying themselves for Pentecost parallels the work that, that the disciples were supposed to do for Pentecost, but the disciples went fishing, and the Jews danced around the golden calf. But Pentecost come, and the beginning of ancient Israel is identical to the end of ancient Israel. So to suggest that the beginning of Adventism is identical to the end of Adventism is an agreement with the most significant symbol of Israel, modern Israel there is, and that's ancient Israel. Brothers and sisters, to suggest that the Seven Thunders is teaching that the Millerite history is repeated in the development of the 144,000 can be demonstrated from all over the place. And the reason it can be demonstrated from all over the place is because when we reach that reformatory time period, the line of the tribe of Judah once again is going to unseal the prophetic truths necessary to recognize that the sealing of the 144,000 has begun. And if you and I do not bring our lives into agreement with that understanding, in the very near future, we're going to receive the mark of the beast instead of the seal of God. <laughs> Line upon line. Here a little there. The story of Elijah. The story of Elijah. Who's Elijah? Well, Elijah is the one that prefigures who? John the Baptist. Okay, so we, we, we got to recognize that that reformatory movement must have some parallels. So you tell me. Let's do a test here. What prophecy 
is fulfilled that marks the time of the end of the story of Elijah. It's a pretty simple one if you think about it. The three and a half years. It shall not rain, except at my word. Right? And there was how many years of drought? Three and a half years of drought when who was ruled? Yeah. Ah, we, we know Ahab was Jezebel was ruled. In the 1260 years of papal rule, in the church of Thyatira in Revelation, how is the papacy symbolically represented in the church of Thyatira? It's Jezebel. The Jezebel ruled for 1260 years, which is how many years? It's three and a half prophetic years. So the three and a half prophetic years of drought that end here marks the time to end in the story of Elijah is the three and a half years of papal rule that ended in 1798. It's the time of the end. At this point, there's an increase in knowledge. Elijah runs into, I don't remember his name, he says, go tell Elijah to meet me at Carmel. He says, I don't want to tell Elijah. He says, go. Remember that? There's an increase of knowledge. There's something coming. It's, it's minor, but it's there. Um, and I don't really, I don't really, uh, I know that Elijah is the one that formalizes the message of that hour. By the way, by the way, let me back up just for a second. What was the, what was the message of the history of Moses? It was to let my people go that we might go out and worship the Lord. Correct? Right. What is the foundation of true worship? It's the Sabbath, is it not? The first thing that Moses did when he came back is he reinstituted the Sabbath. He set forth the foundation right there. Okay. The foundation's always laid in this history. The foundation of many generations. So Elijah comes back. He, he delivers a reform message. And you can show from many places in God's Word that the test in Carmel illustrates Armageddon. It represents the test at the end of the world. It's worldwide. It's representing the, the worldwide test at the end of time. He brings a message of reform to the people. Choose this day whom you will serve. And, that, and that's the foundation of that message. Are you going to serve Baal or are you going to serve God? It's set forth right here at the beginning. That's the foundation. And who goes first in the battle of Carmel? The prophets of Baal. The activities of the enemy are illustrated right here. Where's the manifestation of the power of God that comes next? Fire comes down out of heaven on Elijah's altar. Where's the judgment illustrated? The prophets of Baal are judged. And disappointment. Those of you that know this don't say. Where's the disappointment illustrated? Elijah's fear. Elijah's praying. He, he prayed for rain, didn't he? And he wanted the rain on the first prayer, didn't he? he took how many prayers? Seven. Seven. In association with these waymarks of the disappointment, you will see seven several times. Part of the part of the characteristic of the disappointment, the disappointment of Elijah is understood in the fact that he had to pray for rain seven times. What, what Adventism had to learn at the disappointment was the Sabbath, that was the arrival of the third angel's message. Christ rested in the tomb on the seventh day. Elijah prayed seven times, and ultimately the rain comes. Identifying, you don't have to identify every characteristic. One more, closing. This is Elijah. <coughs> and this is Noah. I like doing line upon line, but I'm tempted to bring the line of Noah over here. What do you think? I'll do, I'll do it. We're doing line upon line. I do not know a time in the end of Noah. I know that when we get to this point, some of us have some conjecture. Some of us suggest that maybe it was Methuselah. Because Methuselah was a living prophecy. And his name means when he dies, it shall come. And if you calculate the age of Methuselah, you realize that the, day, the year that he died was the year that the flood came. So in theory, if he died at the beginning, very beginning of that last year, maybe that was the time of the end. I don't think that is so, but that is the one that people that get familiar with this suggest. There's too many things that have to happen in one year to make that 
about it. But we don't have to know the fulfillment of the prophecy that marked the time to end. It's already established in the other line. There's an increase of knowledge about, basically, about whose prophecy? About Enoch's prophecy. The end of the world. Um, who's the reformer that's raised up? Noah. Noah. He brings a message of reform to the antediluvian world, the whole world. Message of reform. That's the title for reform. First step. Now, how many of you have ever built a boat? I've never built a boat, but I've seen a few people building boats. I've seen pictures of it. What do you have to do to build a boat? First thing you have to do? You've got to build a frame to put it in as you build it, right? You have to build a foundation. First, the foundation is going to be built. Then we should expect to see the activities of the enemies, and we're told that the Antediluvian world mocked and resisted the work of Noah. Then we should expect to see a manifestation of the power of God. Where do we see that? The animals. The animals getting on the ark. And then the door was closed, and judgment was passed on the Antediluvian world. But we should see a disappointment immediately after the judgment. Seven days. And the rain comes. The symbol of the rain that we know as Pentecost and the latter rain. Brothers and sisters, there's more aspects to this. But Sister White said in Great Controversy 243 that every reformatory movement parallels every other reformatory movement. And the most important reformatory movement of all, the reformatory movement that all the prophets were speaking about, the reformatory movement that every prophet wanted to live during that time period is the reformatory movement of the 144,000. And the Bible teaches that surely the Lord God, like God will do nothing except he reveal it through thy servants, the prophets. Mm -hmm. The Lord is now bringing line upon line during the refreshing latter rain time period of verse is true to take God's people back to the foundations of Adventism because that's where the test will take place. Do we accept the foundational premises of the beginning of Adventism as we come to understand the end time message? And brothers and sisters, I guarantee if we're, we're going to suggest to you over the next week about Islam and its role in Bible prophecy, and Islam this is the only thing we're going to discuss, but what we are going to teach about Islam can only be identified if you uphold the pioneer understanding of Islam that's on those charts. And I have an email from the Biblical Research Department of the Seventh-day Adventist Church which says they reject the idea that the fifth and the sixth trumpet is Islam. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the argument that the work of the 144,000 is going to be to return to the foundations, but there will be a controversy over it, because in Jeremiah it says, Let's return to the old paths, and there's a group that says, we will not walk in the old paths. Brothers and sisters, the argument about whether we should be walking in the old paths or not is already taking place in Adventism. And if you do not return to the old paths, and if what we're suggesting about Islam is accurate, you can't sustain it. But if you have the pioneer understanding of Islam and Bible prophecy, you can demonstrate that the role of Islam is to first hurt the United States, because in the first woe, Islam hurt the armies of Rome. And in the second woe, Islam kills the armies of Rome. So Islam will have a one-two punch at the end of the world, and the armies of Rome at the end of the world is the United States of America. And the first work of Islam is to hurt the United States and produce the environment that brings about the Sunday law. And I know that there's some people here in this room that haven't thought it through and do not acknowledge that it is Islam that is bringing on this financial crisis, but it is. They are the ones that are restricting the production of the oil that's raising the gas prices, that's raising the food prices, that's bringing the economy to its knees right now. Nothing to do with blowing up themselves and suicide bombing. You can say anything you want about George Bush. I, I'm non-political. I'm non-political. I believe that whether it's Democratic or, or Republic, they're all globalists, all right? They're all globalists. You can say what you want about George Bush, but when he says we're now in a worldwide war with terrorism, he's right. 
because that is what Islam is all about. And Islam first hurts the armies of Rome, brings about the Sunday law, and they participate in bringing it all down at the end. We're now in that process, and I don't know why I went there. But tomorrow, tomorrow we will attempt to show that there was a time in the end in the Millerite history, 1798. There was a message formalized by William Miller. The message was empowered when an angel came down out of heaven, Revelation 10, that it was worldwide. Great Controversy 611 carried to every mission station in the world. Then the Protestant churches closed their door on the Millerite message, and that the second angel's message was fulfilled in the United States. History White says so. Then the third angel's message arrived, announcing that judgment had begun, and we will attempt to show that at the end of the world, there will be a time of the end, a prophecy that is fulfilled that marks the beginning of the history that is understood as the history where the United States forces the work to receive the mark of the beast. There's a prophecy that's fulfilled that marks the beginning of the healing of the deadly wound. My brothers and sisters, on the testimony of two, a thing is established in the Bible. And for pagan Rome to take control of the world, it had to first conquer three geographical areas. You can find that in Daniel 8 and 9. It had to conquer the east, the south, and the pleasant land, Syria, Egypt, and Israel. Once it conquered the third of those powers, Egypt, in 31 BC, ruled the world supremely for 360 years, according to Daniel 11:24. 24. It should rule for a time, a time of the year, a year is 360 years. The third geographical area that pagan Rome conquered was Egypt in 31 BC. It ruled supremely until Constantine moved the capital of the empire to Constantinople in the year 330, exactly 360 years later. But it teaches us this, that when it comes to Rome, it first has to conquer three geographical areas before it rules supremely. In order for papal Rome to take control of the world and rule supremely for 1260 years, it had to conquer three geographical areas, the three horns the Uruguay, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals, and the third of those horns was conquered in 538. The Goths were driven out of the city of Rome, and Rome ruled the world supremely for 1260 years. Therefore, based upon the principle that upon the testimony of two things established, in order for the deadly wound of modern Rome to be healed, it will first have to conquer three geographical areas. Those geographical areas are identified in Daniel 11, verses 40 to 42. The first of those areas is the King of the South, the Soviet Union was swept away in 1989, the fulfillment of Daniel 11, verse 40. The next verse is the United States, the Sunday Law. The next two verses is Egypt, the entire world. And in 1989, the work of the healing of the deadly wound started with the fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel 11, 40, and the time of the end for the 144,000 had arrived, and the increase of knowledge began. Mm -hmm. This history is already underway. It is already 18 years. It's already long down the road. My math is a little bit fuzzy at this point. The message that's formalized is the third angel's message. And we know as Seventh-day Adventists that the third angel's message, this one here, third angel's message, it's empowered when the angel of Revelation 18 comes down and the earth is lightened with its glory worldwide. It's followed by verse 4 of Revelation 18. And verse 4 of Revelation 18 says, And I heard another voice, Come out of her, my people. My brothers and sisters, the call to come out of her, my people, takes place at the Sunday Law in the United States. At the Sunday Law, the call begins, Come out of her, my people. So sometime before the Sunday Law in the United States, there will be a historic event that takes place that marks that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 had joined the third angel's message. And now when that takes place, the history of 1840 to 1844 begins to repeat. And the ceiling of the 144,000 begins. And this way mark here, marking the activities of the enemies of God's people in the Millerite time period, it was when the Protestants of the United States closed their doors on the Millerite message. This is parallel, parallel 
of the Sunday Law in the United States. When Revelation 18.4 spoke of come out of her, my people, somewhere before the Sunday Law in the United States, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down and joins the third angel's message. And this history up here concluded with the beginning of judgment. This history concludes with the end of the judgment when Michael stands up. And in between the second angel's message and the beginning of judgment, you have the midnight cry and at the Sunday law in the United States, when the church is purified, the weak tears are separated, then the Holy Spirit is poured out with outrageous, and you have the complete fulfillment of the loud cry, which parallels the midnight cry. And brothers and sisters, these reformatory movements are all the same. And this time history is being fulfilled right now. And if we don't understand this, and the Holy Spirit isn't going to be able to wake us up out of our Laodicean condition. And Sister Wiper is the place where she identifies the Laodicean condition. She says, the most, how she say, the greatest deception that can come up on a human mind is to believe that everything is all right when everything is all wrong. And here we are at the end of the world, and brothers and sisters, everything is all right. Everything's all wrong. Yes. And we think everything is all right. Mm -hmm. We think we can continue on just having our Adventist lifestyle mm -hmm. in spite of the fact, as we pointed out last night, that the earthquakes are increasing, the hurricanes are increasing, the tornadoes are increasing, the war is increasing, the economy is going down, mm -hmm. and all, many other factors that demonstrate the probation is about to close. Mm -hmm. So, personally, let me close with one thought. i got a couple minutes. You may not understand, you can't understand this yet if you're looking at this for the first time. This is a pretty simple presentation. I mean, this is easy to see, right? Okay, I mean, you may have recognized some things you never thought about before here, but this isn't really complex. It takes a little bit of time to put it in place, but it's easy to see. But you know what? This presentation here, it doesn't just mean arguments it causes like Whether you believe that or not, it does. And there are certain arguments that come up about this presentation in connection with the division. And I'll share one here just to try to make a point. There'll be some of you, I have to believe based on past experience, there's going to be some of you that are here and say, well, that was all right. But where was Christ in all of that presentation? I heard a lot of prophecy there, but where was Jesus Christ? Sister mm -hmm. White says that we're supposed to put Jesus Christ in the center of every presentation, and I really didn't hear that. Mm -hmm. Let me remind you of something, if you will. I'll pick one example here. The history of Moses, the children of Israel. Remember the rock that followed them? Remember the pillar of fire? Column of smoke? How about the manna? Who was that? It was Christ. But the generation that was living in that history, did they see it as Christ? They didn't realize the symbolism. They murmured and complained. They murmured and complained. And brothers and sisters, you can walk away from here and think that all we were talking about is prophetic symbols. But these symbols are pointing to the work of Christ that is accomplished when he unseals the prophetic words and perfects his people at the end of time in order to finish the work and go home. Amen. And this is the message that is designed by the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin in order to prepare the way for us to perfectly reflect his character. Let me give you one closing argument. This is simple. We all know that the Bible teaches, and Sister White comments on it, more than once, that the work of the Holy Spirit is a three-step process. It's to convict the world of sin, mm -hmm. of righteousness, and judgment to come. How many are familiar with that principle? Mm -hmm. That is the signature of the work of the Holy Spirit. It's three steps to convict of sin, of righteousness, and judgment to come. And in each of these histories, the first message is a reform message. It convicts you of sin. And in the second message, in the midnight cry, Righteousness is manifested, and it leads to judgment. All of these reform movements that we've been sharing with you are built upon the structure 
of the work of the Holy Spirit. First to convict of sin, then to demonstrate righteousness, convict the world of what righteousness is. It should demonstrate the character of Christ. And to identify that that manifestation of Christ's character concludes with judgment. So don't ever doubt that these prophetic lines and these prophetic symbols aren't Christ. They are. They have his very signature. His signature of the Holy Spirit is what it is built upon. <coughs> Amen. Brothers and sisters, the fact that we are studying these things today demonstrates, based upon Revelation 22, verses 10 and 11, that the line of the tribe of Judah is unsealing the truth that takes place just before probation closes. And if there's never been a more solemn message than that, there's never been a message that qualified as a reform message. This is it. This is the message that's saying through Adventism. If they will hear, of course, Adventism has the, the ears there that are the most full of wax of all people, of all time. But if Adventism will hear, probation's about to close, and you and I either come to the foot of the cross and set aside our idols, or we're about to be spewed out of the mouth of the Lord. And for eternity. <coughs> Shall we pray? Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we live in solemn times. We live in confusing times. And we need your presence with us throughout all these times. You might point out the temptations and snares that have been placed in our path will stay on the path. We know that the walk that you've placed your people on is illustrated as a narrow path that gets narrower and narrower. And here we are at the end of the road and we understand that it's high time that we set aside those idols and those wagons and those, the luggage, the clothes and the shoes that are holding us back so that we can get to the point to swing over that chasm you that have made them. Give us the discernment to recognize that it is your voice calling to us at this time. Just as you, you looked over Jerusalem and wept because they didn't know the hour of their visitation. Help us to understand that the hour of our visitation is being repeated right here and now. And that you're fully willing to finish the work in each of us that you began. And give us the, the confidence of your love and your mercy to enter into that work and that experience. We thank you for all these things. And I ask especially that you put conviction upon the hearts of my brothers and sisters who would test what they've been hearing today. And that it would be a will to return here tomorrow evening as we continue on with this study. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.